All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Alyssa. I'm uh, here at my house. I'm a program specialist at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I'm so excited that you all have joined us for the science behind sci-fi film tonight. I'm so excited for this lineup, and I just want you guys to know this is going to be awesome. All right. So what we have for you today, tonight, is four amazing people who are going to talk about three amazing films. And we want you guys to send us all the chats, all the questions that you have down in the chat. So let us know where you're watching from, who you're watching with, what your favorite sci-fi movie is. And then while we do some presentations, give us a question in the Q&A and let us know what's going on. Uh, I will be here monitoring that chat uh, and keeping track of all those questions. But if you have any tech problems, I'll also be behind the scenes and can help you guys out with that. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Vincent Petro. He's here uh, to help guide us through the science behind sci-fi films with the help of three curators from the museum. Uh, Vincent, go ahead and introduce yourself and take it from here. Thanks, everybody. OK, thanks, uh, Alyssa. Hi, um, this is uh, Dr. Vincent Petro. Everybody hear me OK out there? Um, OK, good. I see all your hands up. So um, we're we're going to um, we're going to cover three films tonight with um, three of the scientists from the museum. Um, now, for those of you who know the the science fiction film series, we've we've been doing this for ten years now. This is actually our tenth year coming up this summer, our ten year anniversary. Um, and basically, what we do is um, I introduce the film a little bit. Scientists uh, introduce the science in the film. And when we're doing this live in, in the IMAX, we'll you know, watch the film and then we'll come back afterwards and talk about it. But we're gonna take the watching the film part out of it um, right now. And we're just going to um, introduce the films and then we'll get to your questions sort of one by one. We'll be starting out with um, The Martian first, uh, then we'll do Jurassic Park second and we'll finish up with 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, so the uh, first, the first part here is the Martian, and we're going to uh, be doing that with Dr. Steve Lee. Um, so, uh, Steve, would you like to uh, just say hi? Hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's really nice to be with all of you. Um, I'm joining you from my my living room on Mars, as you can see in the background. <laughs> in my dreams, anyway. Um, it makes this. Uh, uh, sheltering in place easy because on Mars, unless you're in your space suit, you're uh, going to be holding your breath a lot. So we're all very safe. And I, I think um, uh, Dr. Lee is going to talk to us about how he's uh, growing potatoes while he's um, isolating there on Mars. And, and, and we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Um, let me just give a quick introduction uh, to the film, The Martian, which came out just a few years ago. Now, one of the interesting things about this film is um, that it's, you know, directed by, you know, one of the great um, sci-fi directors of all time, Ridley Scott. Um, of course, his, uh, you know, first uh, sci-fi film was Alien, and then he followed that up with Blade Runner, um, you know, directly after that. Um, didn't, he left sci-fi for a long time. He didn't want to get pigeonholed as a sci-fi director. So he came back uh, much, much later, many years later, um, that directed Prometheus, and uh, which, you know, wasn't exactly critically acclaimed, and followed it up with The Martian, um, which is a film that I quite like. Um, and I know Dr. Lee, the first time he saw it, had a special relationship with it, I guess um, you could say, and, and he'll, he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the things I love about the film so much, though, is, is that it tells this wonderful story where basically on this planet for much of the film with just this one person, this one actor, great actor, of course, um, and, but um, I mean, Matt Damon, but we're on the planet with him, just basically the two of us, the viewer and Matt Damon. Um, and so we get this, this intimate relationship sort of. Uh, this one-on-one -on -one relationship with the actor in the film. And the way that Ridley Scott kind of handles that with the, um, with the video journal that um, Matt Damon's doing, um, with the cameras that he's talking to as he makes his way around. 
Um, and it really sort of draws us into the film and, and takes this gigantic subject, science fiction, which is so gigantic, asks these big questions, um, and it kind of boils it down to this wonderful one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I think um, Ridley Scott is really, really good at doing those kinds of things and bringing that to us. There's a ton of things we can talk about. From my end, I like to talk about the film aspects, the cinematography, the setting, the sound. The sound in it is particularly great, especially if you like 70s disco. And, and I know Dr. Lee is a big fan of that. Um, so he might be able to talk about ABBA, um, but- um, Or not. <laughs> we can talk about any of those things. Um, my, so my area is I could talk about the film. You can ask me questions about the making of the film, any of that sort of stuff. Um, and then Dr. Lee will talk about the science of it. So um, go ahead, Dr. Lee, give us a, um, an idea of what you want to talk about. Okay, well, Vincent already uh, alluded to my reaction the first time I saw The Martian, and I will freely admit I absolutely hated it. Uh, I've spent my entire professional life studying Mars since we first started sending spacecraft there, and uh, I'm fairly familiar with the planet, and the movie violated lots of things. So that was uh, sort of a problem the first time. I went about a week later, saw it again, and I made up my mind that, gosh, this is a piece of fiction. It's not a documentary. And uh, then once I got over that, I really, really, really enjoyed it. And I think it, it's very, very well done. It, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna leave it at that because I'm going to start talking about the flaws that I saw, which are where the science comes in. But there's lots of plausible science as well. And uh, what I, wanted to approach this as is there's parts of the movie that are actually factual or based on fact. There's some that are fiction, but they're plausible fiction. The, the technology, for example, is what we could do in 20 or 30 years. It's not Star Trek several hundred years. And then there's the pure fantasy. So I'll try to identify some of those pieces as we go along. So uh, I guess I'd like to start showing some slides if if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. If I can figure out how to do this. So, so I already said what I really wanted to do was separate out the fact, the fiction, and, and the fantasy of the movie. And uh, luckily there's lots in each of these categories. And I'll try not to bore you too much, but uh, the, First thing, and of course, this is in the first five minutes of the movie and very early in the book as well, is they run into a deadly sandstorm that, uh, that blows up very quickly. They decide they have to leave the planet because it's going to, the force of the wind is going to potentially tip over their spacecraft. And as they're trying to get to the spacecraft, as you see here, they're just enveloped in in sand and dust and rocks flying through the air and ultimately pieces of hardware that are blowing off of, of their habitat. And uh, you know how, how real is that? And so just by a little bit of background, one of the things we know about Mars is it has a very, very thin atmosphere. On the surface, um, it's about six tenths of 1% of uh, what Earth is. That's equivalent to being at about 80,000 feet altitude on the Earth. So you need to wear spacesuits, which they're doing, but the force of the wind is much, much less because the atmosphere is so thin. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But the reality of this is there are lots of wind-blown phenomena on Mars. Uh, this is a, a view from orbit, so at the, the bottom of the screen here, uh, this is the North Polar Ice Cap, and right here we have sort of a spiral storm, a cyclone of, uh, of dust that's blowing off of the polar cap. And about an hour later, you can see that this is, has drifted uh, about 100 kilometers, so it's moving along just as a storm would on the Earth, and uh, it's obviously raising dust off of the surface. Uh, this is another view. Uh, again, we have the North Polar ice cap here. And here's a what's called a regional dust storm. There's another one. There's another one over here. If I take 
this one and put it on a map of, uh, of the United States, you can see that this little regional dust storm would actually extend from the Canadian border all the way down into Mexico. And these are very common. Uh, almost any given day on Mars, you're going to have several storms like this blowing around. And uh, one of the other things we see are more localized uh, dust phenomena. This is a dust devil viewed from orbit. This, uh, this is the dust cloud. And this is the shadow of the dust. This is about uh, a mile tall. So it's a really big cyclone that's sweeping dust up off the surface. And what that ends up doing is it removes a layer of dust and all these black curlicues are where dust devils moved across the surface and, and removed some of the dust. So uh, in extreme cases, we actually get storms that cover the entire planet. This is two views of Mars taken about two weeks apart in 2001. On the left, the atmosphere is fairly clear. On the right, you can't see the surface at all. The entire planet is under a, uh, a haze of dust, and that's what's called a planetary encircling uh, dust event, or a PD. I mean, NASA loves acronyms, so we'll just uh, call this a PD from now on. So we see things like this. There obviously is wind on Mars that's able to move dust, but the problem that this poses for the movie is they're moving a whole lot more than dust. They're actually moving particles that are you know, the size of, of rocks through the, uh, through the air. And when you actually do the calculations, um, say it would take something like a, a tropical storm force wind on the earth to do that sort of damage that we saw in the movie, that would actually require a wind on Mars of almost 500 miles an hour. And that's just not reasonable. So, uh, you know, it, that's uh, one of the basic premises of the book and the movie is that uh, this dust storm, sandstorm, caused them to leave quickly. And that just wouldn't happen. So uh, that's where it comes into really the, the fiction part of this. But nonetheless, they, uh, that's what happened. And, uh, and so one of the other, uh, aspects of that is, uh, if you've seen the movie, they, uh, Matt Damon goes and finds an old spacecraft that landed in the late 1990s, the Pathfinder mission, and it was almost completely buried under sand and dust. And um, the question is, could that happen? And so here's a selfie of the Opportunity rover taken in 2005. This was uh, about a year or so after it landed. And you're looking down on the solar panels. Uh, all of these dark areas are the solar panels covering the top of the spacecraft. We come along about two years later, and you see those solar panels are covered with dust. But it's not buried in dust. It's, it's just a very thin veneer, sort of like, uh, you know, if you haven't run a, a dust cloth on the, uh, your, the top of your television for a month, you might get to, that amount of dust, on, especially here in dusty Denver. But then uh, we looked about a year later and the solar panels are cleaned off again. And that's where those dust devils come in. Uh, we think that there's dust devils over much of the surface of Mars. And in fact, we saw these from the, the Spirit uh, rover back in 2004. So all of these white clouds that are uh, that are going past the rover here are small dust devils. All it takes is one of those to go over the, uh, the rover and it sweeps off a lot of the dust that's accumulated. So this was a process that happened year after year with these missions. And so getting back to the Pathfinder, which in the movie was uh, buried, this is what Pathfinder would look like from above. This is a view from orbit taken about uh, two years ago. So this is uh, 20 odd years after landing. And right here is the Pathfinder. And it's actually still just sitting on the surface. It's got a little bit of dust on it. It's still tall enough that it's casting shadows. So it certainly hasn't been buried. 
So now we'll get to uh, what uh, Vincent alluded to about uh, a major part of the movie was Matt Damon uh, growing potatoes by uh, fertilizing the uh, the Martian soil with astronaut poop. And uh, in the movie, what killed those plants was they lost the uh, pressurization in the uh, in the habitat uh, module, and they froze to death essentially in the in the very thin atmosphere. But in reality, on Mars and in in the defense of the movie, th this finding happened after the book was written, after the movie was made. But on some slopes on Mars, this is the rim of a crater. You see these dark streaks going downhill. And uh, this is sort of an animation. Here's the top of the crater here. And you see these streaks uh, developing with time. This typically happens in the springtime. And so the question was, what is going on here? And uh, uh, an orbiting spacecraft had a spectrometer on board, which can determine the composition of the surface by looking at the, uh, the colors of the wavelengths of light that are reflected from the surface. And I'll show you one horrible slide here. But uh, the thing is, this is laboratory measurements on the Earth of materials called perchlorates. They're very uh, oxygen rich compounds. And the thing to look at is this little notch right here. And on the Mars observations, we see a notch in the right place for that. And that indicates that the surface of Mars, at least in some places, is covered uh, or is, has perchlorates uh, on the surface. And uh, one of the, the aspects of perchlorates is they really make the freezing point of water much lower. And so potentially water could be liquid under those conditions. And uh, an example on the Earth is this area in Antarctica it's called Don Juan Pond. Antarctica is the coldest spot on the surface of the Earth, the coldest location. And this small pond stays liquid year round. And when uh, the scientists visited that, they uh, determined that there actually was a fair amount of perchlorate on this location in Antarctica. And uh, that keeps the water liquid, but one of the other aspects of perchlorate is it's really nasty for any biology. It, uh, it, it disrupts all the organic molecules in bacteria and yeast and algae and, and things like that. So it's not a good thing to be planting potatoes in. And uh, so that's, that's something that, yes, you could water the the soil of Mars, if you bring it in, you could add fertilizer to it. But in fact, these perchlorates would make it almost impossible to grow things. And I, I just wanted to end on a positive note of how realistic the technology and the landscape, uh, the landscapes of the movie actually are. So this is a view of uh, Matt Damon looking uh, over the, the valley near uh, where his habitat is. This is their, uh, their uh, rover that he used to drive from the landing site to his rescue site. And, uh, and the spacecraft that they used to get from Earth to Mars. All of these things, they're not off the shelf right now. They're not uh, machines that we have just waiting in the wings to launch to Mars, but they're technically plausible. Um, if we were able to spend enough money to do a mission like this, you certainly could, over the course of a decade or more, build things like this. So the technology, I think, is, is one of those, uh, it's fiction right now, but it's plausible fiction. And then the, the landscapes that, uh, that we saw. This is uh, from the Opportunity rover. So lots of Mars is very flat, covered with very low sand drifts. Uh, some of it is, is a lot more rugged. Uh, this is from the Curiosity rover about two years ago. Uh, so it sees things very similar to what we saw in the movie. And this is a view uh, also from Curiosity of its ultimate driving target. Um, 
in, uh, in Gale Crater. So they did their homework, I think, really well on, uh, on recreating Mars. And uh, the sort of the frosting on the cake for me was at one point they showed a sunset just like this. And like many other things on Mars, sunsets are a little bit different. They're blue instead of red. And that's because of the dust in the Martian atmosphere and the size of the dust uh, grains compared to the incoming sunlight. So I think given all of this, you know, yes, there's some problems. Uh, I, I think given that it's a, a work of fiction and a nice work of fiction, um, we can forgive some of the scientific inaccuracies. And, and the dust storm, which was the biggest thing that I objected to, that makes for a really visually stunning way to force them to get off the planet. So I think that's artistic license. Probably the most realistic emergency like that would be a massive solar flare, and you're not gonna see much. <laughs> And uh, it's a, a more slowly developing event. So if they had to make a choice, certainly for a movie, I think uh, visually stunning is, is probably the way to go. And given all of the other things, I think it was a great introduction to Mars, a great introduction to what human missions to Mars might look like uh, 20 years from now. And uh, you know, ultimately, I guess I'd give it two thumbs up instead of... Uh, five thumbs down, which was my first reaction. So I think well, at that point, I'd better uh, turn it back over to Vincent. Well, that is a much more sympathetic view of the film than uh, we heard the first time we, we <laughs> talked about this. Now, the film came out in 2015, and I think it was 2016, the summer of 2016, um, Steve, that we presented this I think um, that's right. at the IMAX. and. Um, and and yeah, you um, you weren't as sympathetic to the film back then, so I'm glad you've you've come around um, to it a little bit. I've and, mellowed with age, <laughs> <laughs> haven't we all? Uh, um, it, it's interesting you mentioned a couple of things there. I just want to touch on, and then we're going to get to some of your questions. And there's a lot of good questions. There's quite a lot of questions about water. Can you make water? Uh, what's what's the gravity like on Mars? Think about those for a second, Steve. But I, you, you were talking about uh, the views of Mars, the canyons, the landscapes that, that were very realistic. And um, I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, they were actually shot some of the exteriors of the film uh, in, in Jordan. Um, but um, obviously a lot of it is CGI and uh, computer generated imagery. Now that's, that's gonna be interesting because in 2015, you could pretty much do whatever you want with CGI and film and make it look like you know, Mars, et cetera. That's going to feed into our, our next portion when we get to Jurassic Park. I just kind of want to put a pin in that. Remember, when, when we get back to Jurassic Park later, we're going to talk about uh, computer-generated imagery because without Jurassic Park, there wouldn't be the Martian. Um, I'll put it to you that way. So we'll, we'll kind of get to that a little bit later as far as the, as the film aspects go. Um, but but let's, talk, let's get to some of the questions. Um, have been coming in, and please um, go ahead and add them. We have a few more minutes to, to go over questions than we thought we might. So um, let's talk about um, water, Steve. Is it feasible to make enough water um, using combustion um, on Mars? So the the way that Matt Damon did it was he he basically burned hydrazine, which has both hydrogen and and oxygen in it, and it breaks it down and and ultimately you have water running out as a combustion product. And uh, I think, yes, it's conceivable. I think it's a really dangerous way to do it, as we saw when he sort of blew, nearly blew himself up. But uh, that's one of the things that is going to happen on the next mission to Mars, which hopefully is launching in July of this year. They've got a little experiment that can take the Martian atmosphere use, uh, you know, apply uh, electric currents to it, and you're getting the, uh, the uh, oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere by breaking down the carbon dioxide. And uh, that's, uh, that's going to be a really exciting experiment, because if you can get oxygen, of course, that means you're going to be able to breathe. And then it's much easier, even if you just bring along 
tanks of hydrogen or you have hydrogen for rocket fuel, uh, take whatever condensation you get out of the atmosphere. There is a little bit of water vapor. There's possibly buried ice. So uh, all of that, I think, feeds into, yes, you would probably be able to uh, be self-sustaining in, in terms of the water. Now, you said there's a mission going out in July. You think that mission is still going to go in, in, in this atmosphere? Well, uh, so far it is. Uh, the, uh, the workers on it are doing as much as they can remotely. Obviously, the people that have to mechanically touch the spacecraft, they can't do that remotely. But they're abiding by all of the, the separation rules. Just by the nature of building these spacecraft, you're already in containment garments. Uh, you know, they call them bunny suits, these sort of white uh, clean room suits. They have masks on their face. They have gloves on. So the dicey part of that is going to be the launch itself, because launching it, you see images of mission control. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of people sitting there, and each one has a, a very important role to play in the course of the launch. So they're working on how they can reconfigure the mission control centers to separate people um, so they're not sitting elbow to elbow. And uh, they're certainly still launching uh, spacecraft from Kennedy Space Center. So uh, it can be done. It's going to be uh, a slower process to get ready, but they've got, they've got a safety margin built into their schedule. So I think uh, in all likelihood, they're they're going to do that. And it's it's really important to get it off if they can do it safely. If we don't make it within this three-week period, starting the middle of July, it's a 26-month postponement until the next opportunity to launch to Mars. So that's a problem. Now, how long does that trip take, a uh, one-way one -way trip to Mars? Uh, typically, it's about seven to nine months. It all depends on the configuration of the orbits and, and what rocket you use, how heavy the spacecraft is. Um, so assuming it launches in July up through, I think the first week in August is the window, um, it will arrive at Mars mid-February. So uh, that's actually a fairly, uh, fairly speedy transit. Okay, good. Another question, um, what about the uh, spacesuits? Um, in the film, what, what kind of um, suits would be needed, and is that are those realistic in a film? Well, spacesuits, I think, are going to be one of the the real areas that need to be developed a lot more. Um, we see the spacesuits that they're wearing on the space station, for example, and those are the type of things that it takes you hours and multiple people to get an astronaut into one of those spacesuits to do a spacewalk. I think the uh, the suits in the Martian are sort of modeled on that. They certainly did not appear to be the type of thing that in you know, three minutes you'd be able to go from shirt sleeves to, to being sealed up in a spacesuit. So there's a lot of work being done on that of, of things that, uh, you know, one design is you have a hatch on the back, on the backpack, and you just pop a door open and you climb into this ready-made spacesuit and then you close the hatch and, and you're ready to go. There's others that are more like a, a, a leotard sort of thing, a body leotard that, uh, that they can, can use. So they're working on it, don't have the answers to that yet. So that's one of those areas that yes, if, if they had to, they could certainly do those sorts of spacesuits. It would mean you're not going to be spending 12 hour work days out on the surface or, or doing it every single day. But uh, I'm sure in 20 years we'll have different designs. So I guess that brings us to the next logical question is when will we see a manned mission? And uh, don't, do we need manned missions to, to uh, keep up the interest in, in, in space flight? I, I think the answer is yes. I'll answer your second question first. Uh, I think it's always been the case you know, we have real exciting robotic missions, uh, the Voyager missions to the outer planets, Cassini, the mission past uh, the dwarf planet Pluto, all the Mars missions. But in reality, those are on the coattails of whatever the, the human missions are. 
And I think that's that's really the the reality of the you know we need human exploration in addition to the robotic. And uh, I think Mars is a great example. We've been sending spacecraft there since the 1960s. There's still lots and lots of questions that we need to answer before we risk sending people, but we're getting there. We're each uh, one of these successive missions answers a different set of questions, ultimately leading to, can we actually send people to Mars and, and uh, you know, are they going to be able to, to uh, survive? And I, I think the, you know, given all the robotic stuff, it's provided an amazing abundance of knowledge, but it's also acknowledged that any of these missions like the rovers that take years and years to, uh, to drive 20 miles, if you had a person on the surface, you'd probably be able to do an equivalent amount of science in a month, assuming you have the right hardware to do it. So, uh, you know, there's, we, we do the real dangerous groundbreaking stuff with the robots. And then I think people are the logical next step. All right, Steve, thank you uh, very much. We're going to have to move on to the next section here, although we will have time at, it looks like 8.20 8 uh, for final questions. We might be able to um, squeeze some more questions in. At that point, we have to keep a schedule because anybody knows anybody from the museum, museum likes to stay on schedule or else we, we get in big trouble and might get kicked out of the theater. So um, thanks, Steve. We'll come back to you. Um, so we move on to our next portion now. We are going to be discussing Jurassic Park uh, from Jurassic Park from 1993, uh, directed by um, Steven Spielberg. If you're just joining us, I'm Dr. Vincent Petruro, Professor of Film and Media Studies from MSU Denver. Um, that was Dr. Steve Lee um, and uh, Dr. Joe Sertich will be joining us here in a second. And uh, he will be talking about the science of uh, Jurassic Park. But I just want to give a quick introduction uh, to the film itself. Now they it's it's a really interesting film. I we've probably all seen it. Um, Dr. Sertich has a great story about um, he saw it when I, I think you were what uh, three or four years old in <laughs> 1993, and uh, <laughs> and and you um, were inspired to become a paleontologist because of the film. Let me just talk about one aspect of the film very quickly before we get to the science of it, and that is it was one of the more uh, influential films in the course of film history. And the reason being, and is to, to oversimplify it, is special effects. Now, uh, up until 1993, the majority of special effects in film were done the same way really since the 1930s, really since going back to the groundbreaking work of King Kong in the 1930s. And the special effects in film were mostly done with, um, with, with models, um, with miniatures, um, with stop motion animation or, or some variation thereof. Now, Star Wars in, in the 70s started to move um, special effects. Well, I should actually go back and speak about the, the next film we're going to be talking about first. 2001 Space Odyssey in the late 60s started to move special effects ahead a little bit, but they were still dealing with models um, and miniatures at that point. Um, Star Wars started to move things uh, beyond a little bit as far as special effects goes. But Jurassic Park in 1993 was really the film that really catapulted um, special effects into really the, the kind of the next generation, the current generation that we're in. And that was basically CGI. So the, the film when it was first conceived was conceived very much along the lines of every other film that, had, that came before it. It was conceived to be done with models and miniatures, um, with puppets. And uh, that's kind of how they started production of it. Now, as they started production of it, a group came to Steven Spielberg and said, take a look at this. We may be able to do some CGI, this new technology. They set up computers. Who knows what kinds of computers there were in 1990 when they were doing this. Um, they set up computers. They, they showed some animations of some computer-generated imagery of dinosaurs running and Spielberg was immediately hooked and he said, let's do the entire film this way. Um, and that really sort of began the age of the green screen and the CGI that we know today, which um, 
you know, obviously just get got better and better and better. And we saw some of that in the Martian. Um, so Jurassic Park is a real inflection point in the history of film because of just that, just special effects. And oh yeah, it's a really fun, great movie uh, too. Um, and Steven Spielberg is just, you know, such a wonderful director in so many ways. Now there's some great stories about the film. I could go into all those kinds of things if you want. You can ask questions. Um, Hurricane came through in the middle of production. Hurricane Iniki came through. In fact, some of that footage is actually in the film. Uh, but um, we can get to some of those questions later. But allow me to introduce um, Dr. Joe Sertich. And uh, Joe, why don't you go ahead and take it away and uh, talk to us about the, the science of Jurassic Park. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Petro. Um, I think that as I get into the science behind uh, Jurassic Park and a lot like Steve, I'll be picking apart some of the science. I think it's important to remember uh, where Jurassic Park came into the science of paleontology itself. So just like it was a, a revelation for a revolution for film, it was the same for the science of paleontology. And so even though I'm going to to nitpick and pull it apart, it's important to remember this is 27 years in the past when this was made. And at the time it was really cutting edge and it really inspired a whole generation of potential scientists to pursue paleontology as a career. So I'm gonna pull open my presentation. So this is a, a fairly recent paleo reconstruction. I chose this one because it has three of the dinosaurs that you see in Jurassic Park. There's a T-Rex lurking in the background. There's a Velociraptor, I guess, flipping a little rat in the air, and then a Triceratops laying outside in the same position you see in the movie. But um, a lot of the dinosaurs you see in this image, which is fa fairly recent, are quite different from the dinosaurs you see uh, in Jurassic Park. In fact, if you are a kid that grew up in the 80s or before, this isn't the type of dinosaur you would have been familiar with. You would have been familiar with the old way of thinking about dinosaurs as a slow moving, cold blooded reptile that dragged its tail on the ground, uh, needed water to support itself. This is a scene from the famous Charles Knight, paleo artist from 1897. This is his reconstruction of Brontosaurus. Was halfway submerged in water. It was thought that they were so big they couldn't stand it or they couldn't hold up their own weight. Here's a duck billed dinosaur. This is Trachodon, which is now known as a Montosaurus. You can see it's standing a lot like a kangaroo dragging its tail. Uh, one in the background, their teeth were not sophisticated enough to grind up vegetation, so they needed to flirt with off the aquatic plant um, and swallow them whole. This is a poster I had in my bedroom as a little kid. This is the Age of Reptiles, a Rudolf Dallinger picture from about 1947. This is uh, a mural that hangs at the Yale Peabody Museum. And all these dinosaurs are big and fat, low and sluggish. Again, the big brontosaurus is halfway to its chest in water to support its own weight. Not the kind of dinosaur that you see in pictures today. So it's an overgeneralization a bit to say that everyone thought of dinosaurs as cold-blooded and slow. There were some attempts to reconstruct them as fast-moving and dynamic. This is one of them, again, by Charles Knight in 1897 called Leaping Laylock, a tyrannosaur relative, and you can see them in a dynamic pose. But really, this was the exception more than the rule. For about 100, 100 to 150 years, the first uh, part of what we knew about dinosaurs. It really wasn't until this paleontologist, the curator at the Yale Peabody Museum, John Ostrom, started what we call the dinosaur revolution. The dinosaur revolution started in the badlands of the Cloverleaf Formation near Bridger, Montana. And it was this particular quarry, 1964, that really switched 150 years of dinosaur research and dinosaur thinking on its head. And from this quarry, Dr. Ostrom unearthed at least five individuals of this dinosaur, you might recognize it from the movie, one of our raptors. And what he noticed was similarities between this dinosaur, which he called Deinonychus. Deinonychus means terrible claw, and the first bird, Archaeopteryx. So you can see the wing bones, the, the hands of Archaeopteryx and Deinonychus, very, very similar, which led his student, 
a paleontologist by the name of Robert Bacher to reconstruct Deinonychus more bird-like than any dinosaur had been to that point. This is the 1969 publication of Deinonychus uh, with the student's reconstruction uh, showing it as a fast-moving, agile predator. For the first time, this wasn't a slow-moving, dull lizard. Bacher himself went on to push this idea and popularized this idea that culminated in the 1980s with his book, The Dinosaur Heresies. And that really had a huge influence later on the movie. And I'll talk about some of the dinosaurs on the particular the behaviors that came from this book. Um, but for those of you who've been to the Denver Museum, notice this Displetosaurus in the background of the, his book cover. See how that big Tyrannosaur is standing on one foot? Probably looks familiar to you. That is exactly the dinosaur pose for our T-Rex at our front entrance. And that's because Dr. Bacher helped us mount that T-Rex in the early 1990s, right before Jurassic Park came. Another influential paleontologist from this dinosaur revolution period is Jack Horner. Uh, in particular, his discovery of nesting behaviors, the duckbill dinosaurs, this one called Myasaura, the other lizard in the late 1970s changed the way we thought of their reproduction and made them a lot more personal. So these dinosaurs weren't just dropping their eggs and moving on like a sea turtle and letting the young fend for themselves. His research showed that they were laying eggs, they were coming back to the nest, they were tending the, the nest, they were actually even bringing food back to the young. It was a completely different way of understanding dinosaurs. And Horner became really, really influential in the series, Jurassic Park and all of its sequels, in part because he was the main scientific advisor. So a lot of his science uh, from this dinosaur revolution period made it into Jurassic Park and all of its sequels. So here he is on the set, I think of Jurassic Park 3, the big Spinosaurus dinosaur in the back. And the other thing to keep in mind when Jurassic Park was coming out was some of the other discoveries that were going on in the background. So in 1990, this T-Rex was found by a woman named Sue Henderson. And a lot of people will know not Sue the person, but this dinosaur named Sue. So this is a T-Rex that was later sold to the Field Museum in Chicago. And just the year before Jurassic Park came out, it was all over the news because the National Guard and the FBI raided the, uh, the museum that held Sue's bones and confiscated them. It became a long protracted court. And so the, the world of dinosaurs was really at a tipping point when Jurassic Park hit theater. And so again, I'm gonna, in a way, tear apart some of the science of Jurassic Park, but it's really important to remember that this is 27 years old, and we've learned a lot about dinosaurs really because of the inspiration of Jurassic Park and what it fueled uh, in paleontology and the next generation of paleontology. In particular, I want to talk about some of the accuracy of the dinosaurs and their behaviors, and then let's talk about cloning at the very end and whether or not we can actually make it happen. So when I pull apart the accuracy of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, I lump them into three groups. On the left, we have Triceratops, Brachiosaurus, and the ostrich dinosaur Gallimimus that I would throw into a good category. They did a pretty good job. In fact, in some ways, they were ahead of their time in predicting behaviors of dinosaurs. Uh, in the movie itself. All three of the meat-eating dinosaurs on the right, which happen to be most of the superstars of the film, I put into the bad category. Sorry, T-Rex. Sorry, raptors. You're in the bad zone. Triceratops. So the Triceratops makes a cameo as a sick animal laying outside. Overall, they did a really good job of capturing what a Triceratops looked like. Perfectly size consistent. They did a really great job with the horns, skin. I don't really have anything to pull apart with the Triceratops itself, but something that they didn't quite get right was this. This is the big pile Triceratops poo. If you look at the size of a Triceratops, it's about the size of a large rhino or a small elephant. I don't know if any of you have ever seen an elephant produce this amount of poo. A little bit too large. And from what we know about dinosaur feces, dinosaur coprolite, they were much smaller and a lot like animals today. They were feeding on a variety of different plants. Uh, but what Jurassic Park did was fuel this entire science of Jurassic poo. So 
Now we have paleontologists who focus entirely on what comes out the back end of things like Triceratops. Brachiosaurus, another one in the good category. Again, they did a really great job with its size. The one thing that I have to pick apart with Brachiosaurus, and this is something that comes from Dr. Bacher's book, the Dinosaur Heresies book, was its ability to stand up on its back leg. This is something that's purely speculative. And if you watch the movie, this little branch that it's eating, the very top of this tree is already at a, the height of its mouth. So it really didn't need to stand up like that. Uh, the big thing that we don't know is whether the heart of a Brachiosaurus could even handle standing up on, on its head. But then when it comes back to earth, whether those limbs can handle the force of several tons landing on. Gallimimus, the ostrich dinosaur, the ostrich mimic. This was the first time any, at any point when uh, a movie showed dinosaurs in what they call a flock, a group. Uh, up to this point, we didn't have any evidence that Gallimimus or any of the ostrich mimic dinosaurs uh, could run in groups like this. They were flocking. But 15 years later, a discovery from China confirmed exactly what Jurassic Park predicted. This is a map of a quarry from China showing a close relative of Gallimimus. On this particular quarry, they found at least a dozen, 12 individuals of a ostrich mimic dinosaur all buried together in a single event. So Jurassic Park, in a way, predicted that dinosaurs ran in groups and flocked. The superstar of the movie, T-Rex. What am I going to pull apart on poor T-Rex? Well, one of the big things that comes up throughout the movie is, is this a predator or a scavenger? So if you've seen the movie, they put out a, a note for, for the T-Rex to attract the T-Rex. Uh, and the, some of the characters discuss whether or not T-Rex is a predator and wants its dinner served up on a chain or whether it wants to hunt it. This is because of the scientific advisor, Jack Horner. Um, and he was very influential at the time in discussing T-Rex as a scavenger. And so the movie portrays uh, both sides of this argument that T-Rex is a predator scavenger. We now know based on healed bite wounds uh, that T-Rex at least occasionally bit down on things like Triceratops, they survived. Uh, and got away and those, those wounds healed. So that suggests that at least some point, it's a predator. It wasn't just feeding on dead tracers. What about feathers? This is a question I get all the time. And a lot of uh, modern paleo art shows T-Rex with feathers. So in this scene, you see in the background, a T-Rex completely cloaked except for its muzzle in feathers. We don't really have great evidence for that. So a lot of times, People will criticize Jurassic Park and say, hey, maybe the movie should have put uh, a downy coat of feathers over its T-Rex. Well, last year, a couple of, within the last few years, a couple of new discoveries have shown that Tyrannosaur relatives are feathered. This is one called Belong from China. This is a section of its tail with feathers down the tail. But for T-Rex itself, we've started to find patches of skin. This is a chunk of skin from its neck, and it doesn't have feathers. So this is one case where the movie did get it right. So the the Jurassic Park T-Rex probably is an accurate representation of what T-Rex really is. Another plot point is that T-Rex can only see things when they move. If you think about that, T-Rex lives in a forest. It's got trees, the trees aren't moving. How would this T-Rex be able to navigate through its forest landscape without running into things if they weren't moving? In fact, we now know that T-Rex has binocular vision, so its eyes were facing forward. Uh, that's a hallmark of really sophisticated predators, things like owls, eagles, uh, felids like lions and cats. Uh, they use their overlapping field of vision to uh, not only see movement and see things that are still, but also to see depth. So depth perception is something that T-Rex had. That plot point in the movie where it can only see things if they're moving is probably not very accurate. Velociraptor, another superstar, the main villain of the movie. Here it is hunting a, a small child in a kitchen. Velociraptor based on fossils is this little guy. Notice anything different from the Velociraptor in the movie? Quite a bit bigger. So Velociraptor is known for Mongolia from fossils, uh, articulated fossils, really well-preserved fossils, but it doesn't get much bigger than a small dog. Luckily, during the filming of the movie, during production, 
a paleontologist in Utah was looking in an area near Moab and found this thing, Utah Raptor, which basically saved the, the movie's giant raptors by showing that it was possible for raptors to get to the size uh, of the movie monster. And then notice that at least in this reconstruction, all of the raptors, Velociraptor and its cousins are feathered. So this is something that's quite different from what you see in the movie. In fact, this is a Velociraptor ulna, so it's forearm bone. And along the outer edge of the forearm are what we call quill knobs. You can see that in graphic C, that's on a turkey. In graphic B, those are the same knobs that are on a Velociraptor. So we know that Velociraptor itself even though we've never found actual feathers on Velociraptor, had feathers at least along its arm. A lot of other new discoveries coming out of places like China, uh, Southern Europe, and even parts of, of the United States and Canada are showing that raptors and raptor-like dinosaurs were all completely feathered. This is a close relative of Velociraptor called Microraptor. And you can see in the image on the right that it was completely feathered. So rather than the naked movie monster that you see there on the left, we think that Velociraptor was much more bird-like, the picture you see on the right, covered in a complete uh, body covering of feather. Finally, the last dinosaur in the movie, Dilophosaurus, was my favorite growing up. Dilophosaurus is a very charismatic dinosaur in the film, but it was reconstructed much smaller than it would have been in real life. So in real life, the Dilophosaurus is about the size of the dinosaur you see on the left versus the one you see on the right little movie version. However, what the movie did really well was show how paleontologists reconstruct ancient life, and that's by using uh, information from the present. So we don't really have a good idea of whether or not Dilophosaurus had this really strange, vibrant frill, but we, know that we do now know that dinosaurs were brightly colored, so the colors on the frill are very accurate. And what they actually used for this reconstruction was a frilled lizard, something that's alive today. Uh, and all the structures in the frilled lizard are soft tissue. You wouldn't expect them to be preserved. But in Dilophosaurus in the movie, they show that uh, maybe what we're preserving in the fossil record is just a, a very small hint of what these animals actually look like. And then finally, cloning. So is it possible, like Mr. DNA here on the left, to bring dinosaurs back? So the premise of the movie has uh, dinosaur DNA preserved in amber, uh, in particular mosquitoes and other biting insects that have sucked on dinosaur blood are preserved in amber. But one of the main problems with this is that the film's dinosaurs come from throughout time. So this would require you to find amber deposits from at least five different parts of the, the geologic time scale from 200 million years ago all the way to 66 and on multiple continents. So to get the vast array of dinosaurs, you'd have to find lots and lots of different amber deposits. We do have dinosaur chunks preserved in amber. This is a discovery that hit the, the news a couple of years ago. This is a small dinosaur tail. Uh, we don't yet have any of the biting insects that the movie used as its premise. Um, and in fact, if you look inside of this dinosaur tail, you can see things like muscles and blood vessels. Uh, but the one thing that doesn't show up is DNA. And that's because DNA is a very, very fragile, unstable molecule. Research on ancient DNA in moas, so extinct birds from New Zealand, shows that DNA has a half-life of about 521 years. That means half of your bonds are broken after 520 years. Another 520 years later, another half is broken. So after about a thousand years, you only have a quarter of the DNA left. And that means that if you continue that along, after 6.8 million years, every single bond in your DNA is broken. Currently, the oldest DNA has been recovered from Greenland ice sheet, 800,000 years old. Uh, that's not quite enough to get dinosaurs, which were between about 240 and 66 million years old. However, that doesn't mean we're not going to be able to bring ancient life back. It just means that it might not be little dinosaurs hatching out of eggs. It might actually be things that lived a little bit more recently within that envelope of 800,000 years to the present. And that includes things like mammoths and woolly rhinos, and extinct uh, cave lions, and things like that. So even though I've torn Jurassic Park 
Jurassic Park completely apart. It is really influential. Uh, it came at the exact right time. It took a lot of those first ideas from the dinosaur renaissance, presented them to a broader audience, and it presented them to young paleontologists like me. And it made a lot of these ideas, a lot of these theories, uh, part of the common knowledge, part of everyday life. And it led to what we now consider uh, the dinosaur revolution part two, second dinosaur revolution. Uh, right now, we're living in a golden age of dinosaur discovery, where we're finding at least one or two new dinosaur species every month. And we're also using new technologies to dig into dinosaurs, uh, looking for things like behavior, soft tissue, um, every aspect of dinosaur paleontology. I think right now, owes it, it's present to the film Jurassic. Hey, great, um, Dr. Surich, thanks. There's a whole bunch of questions, and um, I don't want to run too far over, uh, but just re let's maybe go through some of them really quickly. Do we know what dinosaurs may have sounded like? Yeah, so dinosaur sound is uh, an area of research right now. Um, in order to understand sound, you need soft tissues, and that's something we don't have uh, a good fossil record of. Uh, all the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park were reconstructed based on blends of of modern animal noises, things like tigers and elephants, um, and other mechanical noises that make these creature sounds. Uh, in real life, dinosaurs were probably a blend of what you hear in birds. The large birds make really deep, thumping, uh, guttural sounds. Uh, similar in crocodiles and alligators, very low, uh, uh, low resonating sounds. Probably not the type of sounds that you would have heard in Jurassic Park. But this is a cutting edge. Of, of dinosaur research right now. In fact, I'm working with some scientists at the University of Colorado Anschutz campus in their audiology department where they study hearing. And we're looking at how dinosaurs' head shape might have influenced the soundscape for the way that they receive uh, sound. So the big frills on things like Triceratops, did that help funnel sound into their ears? Did the horns on their face uh, distort sounds and make it difficult for them to hear a T-Rex coming from the front? Good, and uh, you, you talked a little bit about of uh, a little bit about modern descendants. Can you um, extrapolate what what uh, modern descendants of dinosaurs are still around? Yeah, so some of that early work in the dinosaur renaissance, when we first found Deinonychus uh, and showed that it was very similar to Archaeopteryx, the first bird, led to a whole host of new discoveries that have shown that birds are a living form of dinosaurs. So we all think dinosaurs went extinct with a big asteroid 66 million years ago. But in fact, several lineages of dinosaurs survived. At least three that we know of, three different types of birds, bird lineages, made it through the KT boundary, that extinction event, and are around us today. In fact, birds are one of the most successful groups of vertebrates that are alive or alive today. Okay, good. Dr. Serge, thank you. Um, we run, uh, run out of time for this portion, but Again, at 8.20, we'll have a few more minutes, about 10 minutes for um, uh, more questions. So keep the questions coming and uh, stick around so we can come back to you. Thank you for that. All right, and let's move on to the um, third section of the program that is uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, I'll just give a quick introduction so we can, um, we can move on to um, that part very quickly. 2001 Space Odyssey is from 1968, directed by the great Stanley Kubrick. Um, and it's really kind of known as the first modern science fiction film. And um, to kind of understand that, you have to go back and understand the historical context of science fiction films. Science fiction had been around since the very beginning of cinema. The um, some of the first science fiction films going back to 1900, 1902 by the great Georges Méliès were, you know, had science fiction elements to them. Uh, Georges Méliès, A Trip to the Moon, of course, uh, is one of the most famous films of all time, one of the earliest films. If you've ever seen uh, Martin Scorsese's film, Hugo, um, there's a sort of great backstory about Georges Méliès and about the film A Trip to the, a Trip to the Moon. So science fiction's always been around in film. We fast forward a little bit to the 20s, the, the first great science fiction film 
was Metropolis by Fritz Long, uh, 1925, I believe, uh, from Germany. Um, that gave us a lot of the kind of look of science fiction. What's the future going to look like? A lot of the aesthetic, a lot of Blade Runner, in fact, the aesthetic of the whole city in Blade Runner, a lot of that comes from Metropolis in 1925. Um, Going into the 50s, there was another resurgence of science fiction in the, in the post-war era. The uh, films of the 50s started to, to get a little bit smarter. It was a, a smarter audience, a well-read audience, an increasingly literate audience in the post-World War II era. Uh, films like The Day the Earth Stood Still, Invasion of the Body Snatchers came out in the 50s. Um, and then you have this era between the 50s and kind of the late 60s, where a lot of science fiction was basically B-movies, um, Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Blob, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then came um, Stanley Kubrick, 1968, with 2001 Space Odyssey, which was a lot of things. Um, but specifically in terms of science fiction, it was a serious science fiction film. It was an adult science fiction film and is an intellectual science fiction film. And um, Dr. Yu is going to speak to this in a moment, but uh, one of the things that um, Stanley Kubrick really wanted to do was be very scientifically accurate. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go, um, we'll talk about that quite a bit. But the production itself was a gigantic production, uh, took years to make. They brought people in from all over the world. They shot it on sound stages um, in London, except for a few landscapes they shot in Africa for the first section of Prehistoric Man, that whole section. Um, but um, they brought people from all over the world, came in to see the production and what was going on. And, and one of my favorite stories about the making of it, and I'll, I'll turn this over after this story, is that um, American scientists came in at one point and then Russian scientists came in at one point. This is about 1967. I consider the atmosphere in the world in the Cold War era. And um, so the, the Russian scientists came into the capsule, one of the capsules that we're using, came onto the set and they looked around and they said, wow, this is really great. This is really interesting. This looks really accurate, except for one thing. In the future, all the instructions are going to be in Russian, not in English. Um, but let me introduce Dr. Kuchinyu, um, who is going to speak to the science of the film. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions about 2001, and then we'll come back and answer questions for all the panelists. So go ahead, Dr. Yu, take it, take it over. Great. Thanks a lot, Vincent. So um, I'm going to switch over my screen as well. And um, I think, um, you know, 2001, um, as Vincent said, has been um, very influential and uh, has inspired a huge amount of discussion and writing. There are whole books um, written about what the film means, the science behind it, lots of articles and essays. And if you um, just you know, do a very simple Google search, you'll find lots written about the astronomy and the planetary science and you know, whether wormholes are possible, et cetera. And so what I thought um, I would do it is actually um, take a slightly um, different tack and to look at some of the um, technological aspects, and I'll um, focus down on one particular um, technological aspect, as you'll see. Um, but you know, because the film um, was released in 1968, a year before the first uh, moon landing uh, with man uh, lunar mission to the surface of the moon, it was made at the height of the Cold War and the space race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And so, as a result, it really extrapolated. You know, what might happen if this space race continued at um, full throttle. And so it predicted that by the 21st century, there would be giant space stations in orbit, spaceships spun up to provide gravity via centrifugal forces. We'd have moon bases and we'd be sending um, astronauts on a manned mission to Jupiter um, where half the crew um, was frozen on board in suspended hi hibernation. And of course, none of these technologies have <laughs> Um, now exist today. Um, so we're not doing any of that. Uh, but I mean, there are some um, overlaps with our reality, if you look carefully in the film. So um, we see uh, the existence of video um, calls, um, which is a little bit clunkier than what we can do today. But um, again, um, this, uh, you know, they predict that it came out a few years sooner than video calls became common in our universe. And then um, 2001 also predicted um, tablet computers as well. 
But um, instead of these, you know, I mean, the, these are interesting overlaps with reality, but I think the really interesting overlap is the fact that um, it is one of the major characters in 2001, the HAL 9000 computer. And, you know, and back then, Stanley Kubrick was talking to people at IBM and other computer scientists to figure out what the future of artificial intelligence uh, meant. And today we are seeing lots of examples of technologies that you know you might think at first glance could be as intelligent as hell. I mean, we have artificial intelligence that can beat um, human players in the game um, Jeopardy. We can um, speak to our phones and have um, them answer our questions and we can do the same with our home assistants. And so it seems like HAL um, has a lot of commonalities with artificial intelligence today. First of all, HAL can recognize um, human faces um, and we have technologies today um, that can do that. Um, HAL um, can parse human language, human speech and come up with answers. Um, and then after processing, doing that natural speech processing, um, it can come up with the um, <clears throat> text um, that it can then speak back to, um, to, to humans. And so it might seem like that we are approaching what HAL can do, but um, I'll just give away the point of this talk is that um, I, I, I actually don't think um, we're anywhere close to what HAL can do. And in order to explain that, I, um, I'll talk about um, some things that artificial intelligence in our universe is really, really good at. And that is looking up cute cats on the internet. And so if you do a Google image search of cats, um, you'll find easily hundreds of thousands, if not millions of hits. And you can do the same on YouTube, um, where you can pull up at your fingertips um, cute videos of cats doing cute things. And the way um, that this works is not that Google and YouTube have teams of humans scouring the internet and tagging all the cat pictures and cat videos that they find, but they actually have computer algorithms that, that do all this automatically. And the way that this works is through a technology called a neural network. And it's called a neural network uh, because the computer scientists who are devising these ideas um, thought that it, um, the neural network mimicked how neurons and biological brains work. Although if you talk to neuroscientists, they'll say, no, you know, this is no way in any way form like how um, real human brains work. But um, we'll um, call them neural networks anyway. Um, they involve a bunch of um, neurons or nodes um, as its own in computer science. You have a, an input node or an input layer off to the left, and that receives information from the environment. And then you also have an output layer off to the right that um, spits out information based on the, um, the processing that's done in the middle. And in the middle, we have a bunch of hidden layers. And these nodes in each of these layers are connected to each other. And so as information, comes through that input layer, it gets fed through each subsequent hidden layer until finally it gets spit out into the output layer. And basically the arrows that connect up each of these nodes have different strengths or weights. And they can be arbitrary at first, but what you can do is you can train them in such a way that they can answer a question, is the picture that you're feeding the neural network a cat? And you can uh, get either a yes or no answer. And the way that you do that is you take that neural network and you tell it um, that you're going to feed it a picture of a cat. And in order to do that, you have to um, have a human identify the cat uh, picture. Um, and the, um, that answer then back propagates through some mathematical tricks that that training helps modify the weights of all those arrows. And so over time, as you train it with more and more cat pictures and you tell the neural network, that these are indeed um, cat pictures that it's looking at. And sometimes you can, of course, um, feed it things that are not cats. But um, what will happen is that after many thousands, and oftentimes even after tens of thousands of training pictures, you can get the neural network to basically say, if you uh, feed it a picture of a cat it's never seen before, it will have a certain success at um, identifying it as a cat. And what's really cool about this technique is that not only can you answer yes or no questions like, is it a cat? But you can um, modify the neural network so that it can identify um, a particular cat out of a whole bunch of different cats. You can use it to identify um, any person or animal, any other type of animal or any other <clears throat> object that you can imagine. 
And so um, theoretically, you can have um, lots of thousands of different types of cats that um, people have taken pictures of, and the neural network um, should be able to identify it, it correctly. But we know that this is not how human brains actually work. And the reason why is that it took many thousands, if not tens of thousands of pictures for that neural network to learn what a cat looks like. Whereas if you took um, humans, like um, everyone here um, listening to me, um, you know that um, it only takes a few pictures for us to identify an object. Um, we know that kids um, can um, learn about cats and dogs and any other animal that you can think of really quickly, just from a handful of pictures. And that we also know that a neural network that's used to train on a picture of a cat, and if you give it a picture of this tabby, you'll know that it's a cat. But if you suddenly give it this picture, the neural network gets confused. It, um, it can't necessarily identify this as a cat. You have to retrain it again. And then even if you retrain it on the cartoon cat, if you give it um, the plus toy version, it will also, again, get confused. And so these neural networks are very fragile in the sense that, you know, once they get trained on a particular topic, they're really good at that topic, but they are not very good um, at generalizing um, what um, they've learned. And um, it turns out that um, neural networks can be fooled as well. So this is from a paper from 2015 where computer scientists um, trained a neural network on, this, um, on uh, picking out pandas. And so in this case, the neural network is able to identify this picture of a panda with about 57% um, percent accuracy. And then what they did was they added some noise to that picture. And that noise doesn't um, fool human beings so that um, the picture that results from that noise doesn't look different from a panda to human eyes, but the neural network now thinks that picture is of a given and it has a 99.3% confidence that it's a given as opposed to a panda. Uh, now, normally, you, know, you don't think uh, this type of fooling um, would have any impact on our lives because you know, who cares if the neural network confuses pandas and gibbons, but artificial intelligence and neural networks are used in a lot of other applications other than image um, identification. So there's a huge move right now to create self-driving um, cars, semi-autonomous or autonomous vehicles, and these autonom autonomous vehicles have to, have to be able to identify street signs. There's another paper just from two years ago where the computer scientists were able to add um, some spray paint or some graffiti to um, street signs. And here you can see that the um, neural network misidentified the street signs. So in some cases, 100% um, of the time, they misidentified a stop sign as a speed limit sign uh, for 45 miles per hour. So you definitely don't want your uh, autonomous vehicle to make these sort of misidentifications. Now, in comparison, the HAL 9000 computer does a really great job at um, ident identifying everything. Um, it can identify um, Frank Poole and Dave Bowman, the two astronauts who are awake. And um, when Dave is making drawings of the astronauts who are in hibernation, um, HAL is able to identify them as well. And presumably, Dave didn't have to draw hundreds or thousands of pictures. Um, of those sleeping astronauts in order for um, Hal to be trained on them. And then the other thing about Hal is that um, he exhibits what we call um, general artificial intelligence, meaning um, thinking in a way that human beings think. So Hal um, is able to understand events and he's able to make and execute plans that were not in his original programming. So um, when he thinks that the astronauts are out to um, destroy his mission, he comes up with this really creative plan to uh, kill off the astronauts. And so presumably, Hal wasn't programmed to, um, to think about ramming an astronaut um, with a pod and to cut off their life support, but Hal um, was able to creatively come up with these ideas himself. And then Hal was also able um, and aware enough to notice that Bowman left his helmet in the pod bay when he goes out to retrieve Frank Poole's body. And so um, Hal has common sense to know that humans need oxygen to breathe and to live, that there's no oxygen in space. And without his helmet, uh, Bowman is basically trapped outside the spaceship, especially if Hal refuses to open the pod bay doors. And so in comparison, a lot of what Hal can do is light years beyond what our best neural networks can do. So a neural network is really good at, say, for instance, identifying this picture of people um, playing 
uh, Frisbee. You can even do a Google image search for people playing Frisbee and they'll uh, pull up pictures like this. The network may even be able to uh, tell you how many people were playing and where the Frisbee is. But as AI researcher Rodney Brooks um, talked about, you know, the AI doesn't really have any more context than this. It doesn't know how big the Frisbee is, how heavy it is, typically how many people play Frisbee. Is today a good time to play Frisbee? Or toddlers good at playing Frisbee? And so forth. Um, artificial intelligence don't have the context or knowledge and common sense to really understand the background um, to a lot of the questions that Howe is able to answer. So for instance, here is a question that I typed into Google, who won the Super Bowl, and because Google scrapes um, websites and it knows um, through its um, artificial machine learning that who won the Super Bowl is often associated with the answer here, the Kansas City Chiefs um, who won this year. But if you came up with a completely nonsensical question, such as did Abraham Lincoln know how to snowboard? Well, there are no websites that answer this particular question. And so um, the links that Google pulls out just don't really make any sense. And so um, right now, um, artificial intelligence researchers are not going in um, the direction of where machine learning is now, like um, neural networks. They're going beyond that. They're trying to learn from uh, the best learners that we know about, um, which are human beings, and especially human babies and toddlers. And so it's really interesting to see um, studies um, where researchers go and try and work, um, figure out how um, toddlers or in babies are interacting and learning from their environment. They attach little mini GoPro cameras to their heads and not only to the baby's heads, but also to their parents as they're playing and seeing how they interact um, with each other. And, um, and so they're really learning about um, how young children learn in the world, how objects um, act and react. Um, they learn about cause and effect. And in a way, um, the researchers go or that uh, by learning about how humans actually learn, uh, perhaps in a few decades in the future, we'll be able to apply these, um, this type of knowledge to create artificial intelligence um, that might be more uh, similar to how than what we have today. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks, Dr. Yu. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions uh, just on 2001. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, how close is IBM's Watson to Kubrick's HAL? I actually don't know enough about Watson, um, but I um, uh, so, so so I think it, um, the, the but but I suspect the answer is the same in the sense that um, you know they're using a lot of um, cues and clues in the wording of questions in order to um, figure out what's being asked. But again, um, the computers, you know, scientists and the engineers who built um, Watson will probably say that um, despite all this information that they fed into it, um, there's a lot of common sense knowledge that Watson um, will not necessarily have. And so there are um, probably certain classes of questions that are not asked on Jeopardy that will fool Watson. Now, I do have to say, looking at the, the those pictures that you had up there of the uh, parents and the, the kids with GoPros on, in this current climate with the kids learning at home, I definitely don't think you would want to see, um, you know, my view <laughs> or my kids' view of learning um, anytime, anytime soon. I'm sure my other parents can agree. Um, let's see. There's uh, some other questions. Um, and I'm also happy to uh, answer questions about the other science in 2001, too. I just thought this would be an interesting, weird take on uh, the movie that most people don't think about. Another question. Can you square Hal's behavior vis-a-vis um, -vis attempting to kill the astronauts with um, Asimov's three basic rules of robotics? Yeah, um, and this is something that um, I didn't cover um, in this um, presentation just because I, um, I didn't have enough time. but. Um, Dr. Petero didn't mention this, but um, all four of us are helping to write a book based on um, our talks on these movies. And in the essay um, in the book um, that I've prepared, I actually go into a little bit more detail about this. But um, one of the arguments that people make about um, giving AI common sense is that you can allow AI um, to follow um, Asimov's three laws of robotics. So uh, for those of you we're not familiar with it. You know, Isaac Asimov wrote science fiction 
um, stories started in the, in the 1930s, and he came up with these three laws to constrain how robots could behave. So robots um, cannot, through action or inaction, allow a human being to come to her. That's the first law. But how do you know your action will allow a human being to come to harm if you don't understand cause and effect and how people move through the world and how their um, what their behavior is? Um, it makes more sense that um, an AI like the um, artificial intelligences that we see running, the, like Skynet in the Terminator movies, or the AIs that run the um, world in the Matrix movies, um, they don't fully understand cause and effect, and um, and so their immediate um, you know, go is to enslave humanity or to wipe them out because they think that um, you know, the machines are better than the humans. But if you can instill a sense of cause and effect and knowledge about um, you know, how the world works, you can instill um, ethics. And so some of these artificial intelligence researchers think that it's really only by adding that context, that common sense knowledge, when you have ethical artificial intelligence. Okay, interesting. Um, one other question, really quickly before we move on. Um, when Siri first came out, it didn't understand accents. And is that a lack of neural network training or something else basic in the language programming? No, that's um, entirely um, the training um, that's the problem. So not only uh, did Siri not, um, you know, wasn't able to understand accents, and I think you know, it's gotten better, but um, there are still studies that show that for people who um, speak like a slight accent that's different um, from the mainstream accent, it might still have trouble. Um, but a lot of the um, facial recognition software um, that's out there has traditionally been trained on, let's say, you know, white male faces. And so the, um, the accuracy for female faces drops, the accuracy for uh, people of other uh, ethnicities and um, other races, um, that um, drops as well. So it's actually a really big problem um, when um, the training data that you have or that you're using doesn't reflect the population that you're trying to serve. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Dr. Yu. We're going to uh, move on to the last section here, which is uh, about nine minutes for um, questions with all the panelists. So if you have questions for any of us, um, please go ahead and, um, and send them in. Send them in right now. One of the questions that came up before, Dr. Sertich, about Jurassic Park was, what are the, even if we could figure out the DNA issue with bringing dinosaurs back, are there any ethical implications involved in, with that? Yeah, and I think that extends to more than just dinosaurs, bringing back any recently extinct or fairly recently extinct organism. We have to look at the state of the world. Um, is this the kind of place that can support a large meat-eating dinosaur or a large mammoth um, when we have other animals going extinct all around us? we put those resources into saving wild places, saving wildlife before we lose them rather than trying to bring back a single mammoth or a single T-Rex. Okay, wow, interesting. Um, Dr. Lee, about the, the Martian, somebody had asked before about w what are the chances of there being a, a, a private mission to Mars before you know, th there is a sort of NASA, NASA mission, a SpaceX mission or something? something like that. Right. I, I, SpaceX, I think, is the real wild card here, is they're pushing forward very rapidly to make a really large, very capable rocket that potentially could be flying in the next year or so. And this is entirely designed to carry people to the moon and people to Mars, ultimately. And uh, Elon Musk, the the uh, head of Tesla and, and SpaceX, he's said many times that is his goal is to, uh, during his life, to establish a colony on Mars. And he said he hopes that he will die on Mars, just not in the bottom of a smoking crater by a failed landing. So uh, I, I think if I had to lay money on it, I'd say there's a pretty high likelihood that it's going to be private missions that are wow. the first ones to get to Mars with humans. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yu, we talked about um, the scientific accuracy in, in, in um, Jurassic Park and in the Martian. Can you 
speak um, pretty quickly to the accuracy in 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, if you ignore the, um, you know, the sequence at the very end um, where um, a Bowman goes on this um, trip to um, other parts of the universe, um, you know, 2001 for a long time has um, usually, people have recognized it as probably um, one of the most scientifically accurate uh, movies, especially the portions involving space travel and um, you know, having uh, people um, and how to work and live in space. And, um, and you know, from what I remember, some of the, um, the cribbles that people have been able to identify have been things like you know, when, the, um, when the moon um, shuttle lands on the moon and, and comes down, and you can see it pick up dust because of the um, propulsion um, pushing down. People complain about the fact that the dust that's being kicked up looks like it's being filmed on a set on Earth because here on Earth you have air resistance, and so the dust moves in a particular way. Whereas on the Moon, you can see that so you can see uh, the dust moving correctly. So um, right now, people are quibbling over you know very minor <laughs> details in 2001, at least in the um, the space portions. But for the most part, um, it's usually viewed as being a very accurate movie. And um... Just to follow up a second on that, how um, accurate are the instructions for using the zero G bathroom? Are, are they um, scientifically accurate? Well, um, for, I mean, it takes a really long time to uh, to read through that. And uh, as as far as the only um, actual joke in the entire movie, um, you know, I, I think it's still you know pretty effective, even though um, I have not read those instructions myself. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> Let's see, Dr. Sertich, uh, in Jurassic Park, how realistic is the use of frog DNA to fill in the gaps? Yeah, it was an interesting choice given that um, when Michael Crichton wrote the book and developed the screenplay, that was well into the dinosaur revolution where we were already showing connections between dinosaurs and living birds. Uh, why would you use a frog that's distantly related to dinosaurs rather than a chicken or an ostrich to fill in those gaps? Um, and I, I don't know why, other than the reproductive angle, the fact that um, if you grab the wrong sequences from frog DNA and stick them into dinosaurs, there's potential, I guess, for uh, cascading the reproductive biology of a frog into a, an advanced reptile like a dinosaur so that you could have breeding. Um, other than that, it should have been a bird. I don't know why. Okay, good, thank you. Um... Dr. Lee, can you talk about the book version, The Martian? Um, is, the, the, is the book uh, more scientifically accurate than the film, or does the film follow along closely with the book? I think for the most part, everything that is in the movie is in the book. I think the converse is also true. There's, there's lots of things that are in the book that didn't make it into the movie. It would be a 10 hour movie if they did that. And I think part of what's done really well in the book is, is talking about all the trials and tribulations of that long drive that he had to do to get to the, to the, uh, to the other uh, site with the, the spacecraft that would carry him into orbit. Um, that, for the most part, was cut out of the, of the movie other than it was any week long. Uh, and talking about the uh, sort of the details of generating the water and the details of planting the potatoes, things like that. It's a lot richer in the, in the book. So if you haven't read the book and you've seen the movie, I, I think I would highly recommend it. It's really uh, very, very engaging. Okay, good. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. There's a sort of general uh, space question, Dr. Yu. I think you could probably answer this. Um, I've read that extended time in space causes irreparable damage to human bones, even with people exercising, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. Would the crew be able to survive the extension of their time in space? And I think they're talking about the Martian. But Dr. Yu, would you uh, be able to answer that? Yeah, and Steve can um, pipe in as well. Um, but um, you know, one of the things that I think um, 2001 really does get right is um, putting in centrifuges um, to simulate artificial gravity. And um, we know that um, there's um, bone loss um, in, um, in, and it's pretty um, steady. And so um, right now, astronauts have to spend a couple hours a day exercising to try and minimize um, bone loss. And um, 
being on a six to nine month trip to Mars um, or even further um, away um, in the solar system can be especially problematic um, just because you're on such a long space voyage and if you your bones um, get weaker and suddenly you're on the surface um, with gravity or um, you have to work against gravity to do things, um, that can be a very dangerous situation for the astronauts. So that will be one of the bigger issues to, to work out for long space travel, I guess. Um, all right, thank you all, um, Dr. Dr. Lee, Dr. Yu. Um, let me just uh, follow up on one thing Dr. Yu mentioned is that we um, essentially have written the book version of the movie, I guess. Um, we have uh, co-written a book. Um, it's 10 chapters and 10 films. Um, I write half of each chapter on the art of the film and then uh, one of the scientists writes the other half of the chapter on the science of the film. Dr. Yu has written three of the chapters, Dr. Sertich on uh, Jurassic Park, Dr. Lee on uh, Martian, and uh, there's several other chapters of the book as well. That's at the publisher. Thankfully, they have everything they need. Um, and um, hopefully it will be coming out perhaps later in the summer um, or maybe into the fall. Stay tuned for that. We'll certainly uh, update you um, as soon as the book comes out. Um, but, but thank you all. Um, I'll turn it over to Elisa for her final word here. Um, but thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Thanks to all of our panelists for joining us. Thanks to Vincent for uh, putting this together and um, joining us and giving us all that background. And for all of the science I had, just the craziest night and learning so many things. And I feel like I need to rewatch everything now. Um, I just want to do a quick plug. We do have a sci-fi film series that we're hoping to start July 1st at the museum. Um, it's very similar to this, so you get to see people in person talking about these films um, and talking about the science behind these sci-fi films. So if you can, come by and join us at the museum, and we hope to see you all next time. Thanks, guys.